Welcome everyone, Sam alaikum. I'll just have, give it a few seconds while I wait for everyone to um, arrive to the session. Welcome everyone. I think I will start with the session right now. So welcome everyone, Salam alaikum. Thank you for joining us today and for your interest in joining our session titled uh, Study UK Webinar, focusing on bachelor's, master's and PhD studies. My name is Reem, I'm part of the British Council team and I will be moderating today's session. So a quick overview of uh, today's session. Uh, we will be covering a few sessions. It's divided up into three sections. The first section will be on foundation and undergraduate degrees, followed by um, uh, uh, another uh, a q and a session. And then after that will be the session on master's program and followed by another q and a session. And then after that, the final session will be covering PhD courses and funding opportunities, and again followed by q and a sessions. This session will be conducted in English. However, for the undergraduate session, which is the first session, we have a designated person that will summarize the session in Arabic. A few housekeeping rules before we start. Please keep your mic on mute during the entire session. We received many questions from you prior to the session. Um, uh, we will try to cover most of them. Um, however, we invite and encourage you to drop us any questions in the chat box at any given uh, time. So for everyone's awareness, today's webinar is recorded and will be distributed among our social media platforms. Now, without further ado, I would like to um, hand over to the um, um, Eli, which is the British Council's country director of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Handing it over to you, Eli. Thank you so much, Reem, and thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to hear about studying in the UK. The British Council is really delighted to have the opportunity to bring together some leading speakers from UK universities to share with you the latest information about admissions requirements for bachelor, masters and PhD courses in the UK. The UK is an incredible place to study and we have more than 12,000 Saudi students there annually, which affirms the world-class education that the UK offers and the learning environment that's incredibly supportive and makes so many people feel at home every year. The UK education system continues to inspire generations of young people and more students from across the globe, and they choose to study in leading UK universities every year. UK graduates continue to create their own successful paths across the globe and are amongst Nobel Prize winners, Oscar awardees, Arabia have long standing ties, strengthened by the individual connections that many Saudi graduates um, acquire during their time at UK universities. The topics that will be covered in look navigate through the various options at UK universities and looking for the most suitable courses of studies. Events like these, of course, reflect and celebrate the strengths of the UK higher education system and the impact that UK education can have on individuals too. One of the key values of studying in the UK is the network that you will build with fellow students and with academic support and where you can exchange ideas and knowledge and build resilience. I hope that the session this evening leaves you encouraged and inspired and with the knowledge that you need to choose the most appropriate course of study and ensure that your time in UK universities is valuable and rewarding. So thank you so much for joining speakers and hear questions from our participants. Thank you and over to you.
Thank you, Eli, for your remarks. Uh, now this marks the start of the session. I would like now to hand it over to Dr. Matthew Perry, Director of International Pathway College from the University of York, where he will be covering the foundation and undergraduate programs. Handing it over to you. Thank you very much, Reem, and thank you, Eli, for your introduction. Salam alaikum, everyone. I shall just share my screen with you if I may. So hopefully you can all see the screen. So uh, welcome to this part of the seminar. Thank you very much for taking the time and trouble to join us today. It's much appreciated. So as Reem has said, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction into undergraduate study in the UK. And we're gonna be looking mainly at bachelor or undergraduate programs, but also foundation programs, which are important for students as an access route into their undergraduate degree also. Uh, I'm Matthew, I'm from the University of York, and I'm delighted to be joined today by my colleague Mustafa from Kaplan International Pathways. And as has already been said, Mustafa will provide a short summary in Arabic uh, towards the end of this presentation. So why might you want to study in the UK? We'll the first topic we'll cover. We'll also look at foundation and degree courses. We'll talk a little bit about UCAS, which is the process you use to apply to your undergraduate degree. And we'll also talk a little bit about the different types of offers you might get, how to accept them, and also a little few tips on what a visa application and CAS are as well. And following that, just at the end, I'll give you a few suggestions to what you might like to think about when you are applying for your course here in the UK. So why might you want to study in the UK? Well, very simply, uh, UK universities are some of the best in the world. Um, you will enjoy a really high quality of education here. Many of our universities are ranked in the top 100, top 200 of the global universities. And that's really important. Equally important is you can access a really great variety of different courses. These range from things like medicine to courses around the creative arts, music, theatre, film, television, business, economics, all sorts of different science, technology, engineering and maths courses. Pretty much everything you can think of. Most UK degrees are typically three or four years. There are three in England, Wales and Northern Ireland in four, they have four years in Scotland. And you will, of course, be taught in English language in the home of the English language. And this is really important because it's widely used in business globally. Thinking about business as well, most degrees in the UK now have a good degree of employability built into them. And this is really important when you come to get your degree and then graduate into the world of work afterwards. We're building lots of what we call transferable skills, which are important for whilst you're studying your degree, but will also help you in the world of work. At the end of your degree, if you wish to remain in the UK, you can. There is an excellent post-study work visa, which can last for two years in the first instance. So there are plenty of good opportunities to stay in the UK if you wish. Equally, you may wish to return home and work there. In terms of cost of living, the UK is very competitive, especially against other international popular destinations. And the uh, options around living in the UK are very, very positive. It's a really, really multicultural society. There's lots of interesting and exciting events you can take part in. And international students have been coming to the UK for many, many years. So there's excellent support in place for them. The vast majority of universities have very, very well developed international support networks for students to help you inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And if you've got a bit of spare time and want to do some traveling, the UK is a great gateway into Europe. Anyway, let's start with a quick look at foundation courses. So what is a foundation course? Well, for students who've studied 12 years in their high school, so for example, in Saudi Arabia, you may have done your Thanawiya, then the foundation course provides an extra top up year, which brings you up to the same level as home students from the UK, which means when you start your degree, you are all starting at the same level. And they're a really good preparation into your degree and study at university life. As I've said, they help you meet your degree entry requirements. And on good foundations, you won't just study English language, you will study a lot of academic content, subject materials, and crucially, you will also study study skills. And these are really important in helping you adapt to university life and get the best out of your degree. There's also lots of support for students adjusting to life in the UK, and you will get help with simple things like registering for the doctors, opening bank accounts, and just gradually settling into life. They are typically two or three terms in length, but they provide a really great start into 
academic life in the UK and they're an excellent route into a number of high quality universities and undergraduate degrees. Entry requirements for foundations and degrees will vary by different institutions, but broadly speaking, if you have completed your FANAWIA or equivalent, then you will be eligible for a foundation. And English language scores, again, do vary, but, excuse me, IELTS 5.5 is a fairly typical entry point. If your language skills are a bit lower than that, you may be able to take a longer course and still be admitted onto the foundation programme. But as I say, they're a great route into your undergraduate degree. There are a number of different ways you can apply for a foundation. You can apply directly with the foundation provider, so that may well be direct to the university, or you might, as we do here at University of York, partner up with another organisation such as Kaplan, and you can apply through their partner organisation as well. Equally, you can go through an application through an education agent or a counsellor. Sometimes you might apply directly to a university, but if they feel you need that you will benefit from you take a foundation, then they will direct and refer you on to the foundation provider if they feel that's appropriate. But as I said, it's a very straightforward process. And in all of this, I'd encourage you to do some research because there's lots of really good options out there from lots of different brides. So that's foundation. Let's now have a think about undergraduate degrees. As I say, you may need a foundation in order to access the undergraduate degree, or you may be able to apply directly. So what can you expect out of a degree in the UK? Well, as I said before, most international students will study a three-year undergraduate bachelor's degree, or it's four years in Scotland. Typically, but not always, you will do around six different modules per year. Each module is normally worth around 20 credits, and you'll do for about 120 credits each year of your degree. Now, it depends very much on what subject you are choosing, but you will find that your lectures and your courses or have a range of activities on them. You may find yourselves in workshops. You could be doing laboratory work if you're studying STEM subjects, so that science, technology and engineering type subjects. And you may well find you're doing some field work as well, especially if you're in the life sciences. But there's generally speaking, a really broad range of opportunities. Some are quite specialized. If for example, you're doing law, you may well find yourself in a MOOC course. There's lots of great ways of learning and it's not all just about taking notes in lectures. We're really encouraging students to be active in their lessons and in their lectures and learning. As you progress through your degree, you will often find that certain modules are optional. So this allows you to sort of tailor your course into the areas that you're most interested. And increasingly so in forward-looking universities, you will now find examples of what we're calling interdisciplinary modules. These are modules that cut across lots of different subjects. So a good example is about tackling really large problems such as global warming, where they are not constrained by the typical subject boundaries. So lots of really great choices there. Now, what's really important, especially if you are a sponsored student, is that the course and the uh, university that you wish to apply for is on the approved Ministry of Higher Education list or your sponsors list. Now, you can check that out. There's a web link there. I suggest if you're not familiar with that, you make a quick note of it. These slides will be available later on as well. So don't worry if you can't jot it down now. And a little tip for you is that if you are being sponsored, often sponsoring bodies will not sponsor for what we call a combined master's program. So that's a master's in engineering or an MSci. You can still do a master's, but you normally do your degree first and then you apply for your master's separately. So how do you go about applying for these courses? Well, most students, whether you're a UK student or an international student, go through a system called UCAS. And this is specifically aimed at applying for undergraduate courses in the UK. The UCAS system is online and it's actually very simple to apply for, but you need to have done a little bit of research before then because you can apply for up to five different courses from five different universities in the UK through UCAS. So do some research, choose your favorite courses in which universities. And again, a little bit of advice, don't choose five courses that are right at the very top end of what your expected grades may be. If you know your grades already, that makes things a little bit easier. But if you're working on expected grades, I'd strongly suggest you apply for a range of courses from sort of the high end of your expected grades to a sort of mid to a low point. 
it's very simple. You can do all of this online. You will need some basic details around yourself and about your prior education as well. As I say, you'll need to identify which courses and which universities you would like to apply to. You will be expected to write a personal statement where you say and explain a little bit about yourselves and why you want to do particular courses. And you will also need to get a reference. Now, this is someone who knows you academically. So it may be from a teacher, maybe from your headmaster. It could be from a tutor. But they'll be required to submit a reference. Now, just a little tip again. This system is changing in 2024. So if you're not applying just yet and you're waiting for the current, uh, you're waiting to apply for the next cycle, you will find it slightly different from this year's cycle. However, you will still need to provide a personal statement and you will still need to get a reference. It's just the structure will be slightly different. So watch out for that. Once you've got all that information together, you can submit your application and that will then be automatically sent to all the different universities that you've said you're interested in applying to. Now, it's worth noting some of these deadlines, especially if you're wanting to apply for the likes of Oxford and Cambridge or really competitive such as medicine, uh, veterinary science and dentistry. Deadlines for this year's applications, so that's for students who wish to start at a UK university in September 2023, was actually the 15th of October last year. The deadline for most students is around the 25th of January. Now, don't worry if you're thinking, oh my goodness, all those dates have passed and I've missed it. You haven't. There is much more flexibility for international students built into these. But if you're thinking of applying for next year, do bear in mind these dates because they will be similar for next year's applications as well. I would strongly encourage you to get any application in by the 30th of June. That means you'll automatically be entered into something called clearing. And clearing is a system whereby students who have not been successful in their first and second choices can be matched against universities with other offers and spaces that are still available. So it can be a really useful system if need be. So you've applied, you've put your UCAS application in and you've got an offer. Typically, there are two types of offers that you might get, a conditional offer and an unconditional offer. Conditional offer is where the university is still waiting for some additional information from you. This may be that you need to upload some school grades, or it might be, for example, an IELTS test to demonstrate your English language skills. Once you've met all those requirements, you'll be given an unconditional offer. Essentially, you've then got your place, and the next step then is for you to accept that offer. So how do you do that? Well, it depends if you're a sponsored student or whether you're a self-funded student. By self-funded, I mean, are you paying the fees or are your family paying the fees? If you are a sponsored student, you will need to provide the university with a financial guarantee letter, and this can be obtained from your sponsor. If you are a self-funded student, you will need to pay the deposit on the course. And please don't forget to sign the offer acceptance form and send it back to the university. Once you've accepted your place, you then have to start thinking about how do you get a visa? Because you will need a visa, a student visa to study in the UK. All international students do. So the university will issue you something called a, con a confirmation of acceptance for studies or CAS for short. That's an electronic record that you will then need to give to the home office to apply for your visa. All international students need one of these. So once you've got your CAS, you can then apply for your student visa. Each university or foundation provider will offer you some assistance around this. It can be quite a complicated process, so do allow plenty of time to do this. And you can always seek advice from an educational agent or counsellor if they're helping you with your application process as well. So that's a very quick introduction into how you might apply for university and the difference between foundation and degree courses. Before I hand over to Mustafa, who's very kindly going to summarise this in Arabic, I'm just going to share with you a few top tips that I've learned over the years from talking to lots of international students and also their parents as well. Number one has to be choose a subject you enjoy. It's really important that you enjoy your time at university and studying something that you enjoy, that you have a passion for, is really, really important. Those dark winter mornings where it's a bit cold and you don't want to get out of bed, 
it's really hard if it's you're doing a subject that you don't enjoy. You need to have that passion. Equally, do some research about both the courses that you'd like to study, what might happen next in terms of employment, and where you might want to study those. One of the most popular courses we have in the UK at the minute is around cybersecurity. It's very much on trend. But actually, if maths perhaps isn't your strong point, or you maybe don't like working with numbers, perhaps that's not the right course for you. But if you're really interested in, com in com working with computers, you might be much more interested in something in the creative industry around computer video game design, film, television, that sort of thing. So do some research. It's really important you get on the right course. And I say it's a course that you enjoy. Some courses sound very similar, but there's a big difference between studying environmental science, for example, and ecology. Some differences are also quite subtle. You can study a BSc in psychology at some universities, or you can study a BA in psychology. Again, make sure you do your research and you know the difference so you get on the right course. Many universities in the UK are divided into either a campus or a city centre university. And by city centre, I mean that the university buildings are more scattered around and into space with other office buildings and shops and things. Decide what you kind of want. This is not really about the learning. It's much more about the environment in which to live. There are positives for both. I know many students who like a campus environment because everything's close together. It's easy to get from your accommodation into your lectures and there's a nice community feel. Other students like the vibrancy of living in a city centre. So it's very much a personal uh, feeling what you want. Another top tip, and you may laugh at this, but learn to cook. You will be living away from home. It may be the first time you've lived away from home. You will need to feed yourself and it's a great way of making friends. Often the most popular people in your flats and house sheds are the people who can cook and it's a great social occasion and a way to meet new people. Another good way of meeting new friends and people is to join clubs and societies. Universities have lots of sports clubs and they also have lots of societies where you can meet like-minded people who share similar hobbies. One of my favourite societies here at the University of York is actually the Baking Society where you can go and make lots of lovely cakes and share those with your friends but whatever you're in, there's probably going to be a society for you. Finally, coming to university is a great experience. It will be an opportunity to make lifelong friends. And I'm really delighted to say we've actually got an alumni here on the call with us, and it's not me. But you need to work hard, but make sure you have plenty of fun as well. So thank you very much for, for listening to me today. And I'm now just going to hand over to Mustafa to give a quick summary. So thank you very much, Mustafa. Thanks so much, Matthew. Um, okay, uh, so I will start the session in Arabic. Marhaba, بطلاب الأعزاء شكرا كثير لتواجدكم معنا اليوم. طبعا ما عندي وقت إنه أشرح كل شيء تفضل فيه ماثيو بس راح أعطيكم فكرة سريعة بخصوص كل النقاط اللي تكلم عنها. فبالبداية بالنسبة للفاونديشن uh, foundation هو السنة التحضيرية اللي uh, الطلاب يحتاجوها للدخول للجامعات في بريطانيا. Uh, الطالب اللي يدرس uh, في بريطانيا يدرس 13 سنة قبل ما يدخل ال foundation uh, قبل ما يدخل للجامعة. فالطلاب uh, في منطقة الشرق الأوسط إحنا ندرس 12 سنة في الثانوية. Uh, فلذلك نحتاج كمان سنة عشان نضيفها لسنين الدراسية للدخول للجامعات مباشرة. Uh, فلذلك تحتاجون هذه السنة التحضيرية. أنا شغال في كابلان وكابلان هو فاونديشن بروفايدر عندهم سنين تحضيرية يعطوها للطلاب وفي كثير بروفايدرز في بريطانيا يعني مش بس كابلان في كثير بروفايدرز موجودين ممكن التقديم معهم للدخول للجامعات في بريطانيا فبالنسبة لهذه السنة يعني الهدف منها إنه بالبداية تخليكم واصلين للمستوى الكافي للدخول للبكالوريوس وكمان يعني هي بداية سهلة للبرنامج تبع البكالوريوس عشان تتعود على يعني المعيشة في بريطانيا وتكون مستعد للسنين الجامعية بالنسبة للفاونديشن لازم تكون مخلص الثانوية لازم تكونون مخلصين الثانوية يعني ما ممكن تدخل إذا خلصت بس 11 سنة لازم 12 سنة بالكامل ومعدلات الدخول للفاونديشن تختلف من جامعة لجامعة فمثلا جامعة يورك يحتاجون معدل 80% جامعات ثانية 
احتمالي شوية أقل فيعتمد على الجامعة اللي حاب تقدم عليها بس حوالي 80% هو المتطلب الرئيسي بالثانوية وكمان بالنسبة للآيلتس تحتاج ما يعادل 5.5 بالآيلتس وكمان كل سبسكيل كل كل فقرة بالآيلتس الريدنج والرايتنج والليسنج والسبيكينج لازم ما يكون أقل من الأربعة عشان تقدمون على سبيدن فيزا إذا كان مستوى الآيلتس أقل من هذا المستوى فلازم تاخذون كورس لغة بالبداية وبعدين تلتحقون بالفاونديشن بالنسبه لطريقه التقديم ممكن التقديم عن طريق عن طريق الموقع الرسمي للفاونديشن بروفايدر او ممكن التقديم مع مكاتب ايجنتس في في السعوديه مثلا ايجوكيشن ايجنتس في كثير يعني هم متعاقدين مع جامعات ممكن يساعدوكم بالتقديم على الفاونديشن بس هو الفاونديشن يعني شيء رئيسي تحتاجه للدراسه في بريطانيا ما ممكن التقديم مباشره على الجامعه من غير الفاونديشن بالنسبه للبكالوريوس مده برنامج البكالوريوس ثلاث سنين والفاونديشن مدته سنه فكله على بعضه يصير اربع سنين وما يعادل الشهادات اللي ندرسها في الدول العربيه ف يعني تحتاجون الفاونديشن عشان تعادلون الشهاده وتكون شهاده معترف فيها في الدول العربيه بالنسبة لبرنامج البكالوريوس مدة ثلاث سنين مثل ما مثل ما خبرتكم وبالنسبة للمواد اللي تدرسوها في البكالوريوس ست مواد كل سنة وطريقة الامتحانات تختلف عن الدول العربية يعني مش بس امتحانات احتمال يكون في بروجكت احتمال يكون في اسايز يعني يختلف من من مجال لمجال مثلا اذا عم تدرس انجينيرنج مثلا فكتير في بروجكت في المواد اللي حتاخذوها آه، كثير مهم تنتبهون على الـ على السبجكت آه، الشهاده اللي عم تقدمون عليها فيعني اذا مثلا عم تقدمون على شهاده انجينيرنج مع جامعه معينه آه، اتاكدوا بالبدايه انه هذه الجامعه آه، يعني هي موافق عليها من قبل وزاره التعليم او السبونسر اللي انتم عم تقدمون من خلال آه، في عندكم يعني سكولرشيب في كثير منح في السعوديه مثلا مسار امداد في كثير جامعات يعني معترف فيها وفيها انجينيرنج فممكن تشيك على الموقع قبل ما تعمل التقديم فتاكد انه يعني الشهاده راح يكون معترف فيها بعد ما تخلص البرنامج بالنسبه لليوكاس اليوكاس هو اللي تحتاجه للتقديم على البكالوريوس بس مثل ما خبرتكم بالبدايه تحتاجون فاونديشن فاذا درست الفاونديشن اصلا ما تحتاجون اليوكاس لان انت بس تخلص الفاونديشن تدخل مباشره للجامعه بس اذا لاي سبب من الاسباب حاب تغير الجامعه فممكن تدرس ممكن تقدم عن طريق اليوكاس في مواعيد معينه اليوكاس فلازم الانتباه عليها التقديم لازم يكون كثير مبكر فمثلا اذا حاب تدرس في سبتمبر 2023 التقديم من الان لازم يكون التقديم من الان والديدلاين يوم 20 واحد ممكن التقديم بعد بعد هذا التاريخ بس يعني يعتمد اذا في اماكن فارغه بالجامعه ولا لا بالنسبه للمستندات اللي تحتاجوها شهاداتكم شهاده الثانويه شهاده الايلتس وكمان ريفرنسز مثلا من استاذ من من المدرسه او من الجامعه يعتمد على شو عم تقدم على الفاونديشن ولا على على البكالوريوس مباشره واخر شيء حاب اذكره بالنسبه للقبولات اللي تحصلوها من من الجامعه في قبول اسمه كونديشنال اوفر يعني قبول مشروط وفي قبول ثاني اسمه unconditional offer يعني قبول نهائي غير مشروط يعطوكم القبول المشروط بس يحتاجون منكم مستندات اخرى مثلا شهاده الايلتس لحد الان يعني عملت تقديم وما اخذت الايلتس فيعطوكم قبول مشروط على الايلتس فمكتوب بالقبول اعطينا شهاده الايلتس عشان نعطيك القبول النهائي فبس يكون عندك القبول الغير مشروط بس توفي كل الشروط تبع القبول ممكن يعني تخلص اجراءات القبول و يعني تقبل الاوفر وتحجز مكانك لبدء الدراسه في شهر في شهر تسعه او متى حابين تبداون الدراسه بالضبط. وبالنسبه للتقديم على الفيزا بيكون من خلال مساعده الاديوكيشن ايجنت تبعكم في السعوديه او ممكن التواصل مباشره مع الجامعات كل جامعه عندها فيزا تيم بيساعدوا الطلاب بالتقديم على ال على الفيزا فهذا كان ملخص لكل اللي ذكره ماثيو 
اذا عندكم اي سؤال او اي استفسار ممكن كتابه السؤال في ال Q&A box. Yes, thank you both uh, to to you, uh, Mustafa and Dr. Matthew. Um, that was indeed very informative. It, it, that presentation carried a lot of rich information for any new students wanting to study to study in the UK for the first time. Um, I can see here that we're running a bit um, over the next session. So quickly, Susie, can we have uh, maybe two questions we can answer or three um, so we can move on to the next session, please. Um, yes, I have a question here, uh, one in Arabic, so I will direct it to you, uh, Mustafa. Uh, 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 يعني يكتب بالجوجل مسار إمداد وراح يشوف كل الجامعات اللي معترف فيها ل لعلم الجينات وبعدها ممكن تقدم على هذه الجامعة مثلاً مش عارف يعني مثلاً تشوف جامعة يورك ولا جامعة سفات كلايد ولا أي من الجامعات اللي معترف فيها تقدم هذا الشيء ممكن التقديم معه مباشرة لحصول على هذا القبول وبعدها تخلص الإجراءات بس يعتمد يعني شو الجامعة اللي شو الاسكولارشيب اللي راح تقدم عليه وأي جامعة حاب تقدم معها إذا حاب تدر يعني تدرس مثلاً في سكوتلندا ولا في إنجلترا يعتمد على البريفرنسز تبع الطالب. There is another question. I want to know about um, dental aesthetic master degree. So we will be directing this question for the next session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, both Dr. Matthew and Mustafa. And um, earlier, they put on the slides their email handles. So if you have any more um, questions, please, you can direct it to them or you can reach out to the British Council so we can help you further. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to you. Thank you. Um, now I would like to move uh, the session to the master programs. Uh, the session will be covered by Professor Ibrahim Khadra. He is the principal advisor for the MENA region for Strathclyde University. Handing it over to you, Dr. Ibrahim. Shukran, Yanim. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to talk to you guys uh, about the master sessions. I'm going to share my slide. I don't know, can you see it? Can you see my slide? Yes, now? we can see it. Excellent. Uh, first of all, let me thank you. But maybe, Marine. sorry, Professor, can you please make it into a PowerPoint slide? It is now. Can right. you present? Can you see it in a PowerPoint? No. Now? I cannot. I'm not sure if everyone, anyone else is. Can you see it now, Reem? No, I'm still looking at how it is from your view. Maybe we can take it back and we can just um, uh, see it. Uh, you can present like uh, just like so for, for now. Is that OK like that? No, not yet. Maybe keep it in no. reading. Uh, the reading view, maybe that would be that would solve it. OK. Uh, can you see it like as a reading view now? Yeah? Yes, we can. Perfect, excellent. Okay, so Reem, thank you very much for you guys in the British Council, for the invite, for Ellie doing a great job, and for you and for Susie and for all the teams in, uh, in, in British Council in Saudi Arabia to start with. Secondly, I would like to um, really congratulate the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on the Foundation Day. So, you know, it's a country that is progressing very well. We see, mashallah, tabarakallah, you know, every day progress in education, in health in all subjects. So it's a country that every visit I come to Saudi Arabia, there is something in you. Uh, there is progress in, in one area of, or the other. So I congratulate the kingdom and the government and the king and the crown prince for all the success uh, uh, that it's going on in this part of, of the world. So we're proud to work with them and we're proud to be um, 
you know, um, doing a lot of work with multiple institute in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So in my presentation today, I mean, as, as you said, I'm the principal special advisor for MENA regions, and I'm a pharmacist by trade. So I know there is a question about my, my pharmacology, which I'll come back to you at the end of my presentation. So what I'm going to cover today is the master degree or studying master in UK. And I'll be talking in general about master in, in UK, not necessarily about Strathclyde University, which we are one of the other universities that delivering master classes or master courses in UK. So what I'm going to cover in my presentation today, it's uh, the UK master model. You know, what do you expect when you come to study a master degree? How it looks like, the structure of the masters, the subject that you can study in UK, how do you find the right subject for you? I'm going to cover that. Again, you know, the other one is why do you need to study in UK? Why not somewhere else? What advantage of coming to UK? So again, I'll cover that. And I will uh, give you some hints on how to apply and, um, you know, probably talk a little bit about funding for some courses, because I know in some certain uh, countries, probably there's um, scholarships or funding, governmental funding schemes. But what you need to know as well, some university have some funding in a place or support for some partial uh, scholarship that you can take advantage of. And at the end, I will finish with uh, what support services, which I know Mustafa Kandli and Matthew have covered in their presentations. You know, if you have a problem with a visa, if you have a problem with any issues, you know, there is a support team that will be able to help you. And I will share with you at the end uh, the contact details for my team, or actually the teams here in Strathclyde, who can help you if that's your decision to study, uh, you know, uh, in UK. So, master degree in UK, uh, what, what do you expect? It's a very fast, fast intensive course. Is it 12 months is the norm? Doesn't take long, really. Within a year, you're done. You start in September and you finish in September, you know, or even August. Uh, again, course subject and options. This is the beauty of the studying in UK. You can have a, a, a major subject where you need to finish, you need to study, you need to pass but you have optional uh, subject where you can choose from. I mean, today, for example, I was talking to uh, some of our friends and colleagues in the education department, and I've discovered some of, you know, they have a course around uh, transitional studies. And in the trans transitional studies, you can study uh, optional courses like uh, government policy, for example, or international uh, relation. So again, you can select some options which you think or actually is important for your career, and it's important in your country. So, you know, those optional courses is really added values uh, to your study. Again, uh, the 12 month is not all uh, taught courses. So two thirds of the program is taught courses. Two thirds of the program is taught, mean in no dirasa, research, either exam at the end of it, or some courses, uh, you know, they will they, they can be assessed by a C or by uh, you know um, um, a piece of work that you need to to complete. So not all the courses you need to do exam. You know, some of them is you need to do a you know um, a C submit an C or or something like that. So that's the first two third or the first uh, let's say six month of the program. The last three months of the program is really research focused. And I think this is very important for everybody to know that. So there is a dissertation, a research project where you can select. Uh, most of the university will give you subjects that you can select from, and you have different supervisors that you can choose from. And that dissertation is very important because it's for 60 credit of, 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 your, uh, of your study. So again, you know, the reason I'm saying that. This is, if you are planning of studying a PhD, and I know uh, a colleague will cover a PhD shortly, but that's when you can select maybe a subject uh, or a topic that is related to your PhD, and you might want to select your supervisor at this, this, this stage, a supervisor that you can carry on doing your, master, your PhD with him. Which is the next point, you know, once you've done the master, you know, you can naturally progress into a PhD or a PhD program. Now that has been said, that's the UK, call it a MSc by taught, but there is other master courses where you can persuade or you can do like MRES, MRES, which we call it a master by research or MPhil, 
which is master of philosophy. I know I'm talking about this, so you know you're aware of them, but I know they are not approved in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But Adola Kursin, uh, Saudi, uh, they don't support them, you know, the Emirates or the Amphil. So probably for Saudi Arabia, the MSC taught courses is the way to go. Range of subject, of course, you know, choice of subject is vast. You know, you, it depends on what area or you want to study. You can search and you can find different subjects. You know, you can study pharmacy, you can study engineering. And once you know the subject area of your study, you can even go into specialization. I'll give example, you know, I'm a pharmacist by trade. So, you know, in pharmacy, you can come and do a master in pharmacy. But in what? You know, you can do it in pharmaceutical analysis. You can do it in... Uh, I don't know, industrial pharmacy, you can do it in pharmaceutics, you can do it in pharmacology, you can do it in any subject area or, you know, specialized area of your interest. Now, something is very important. When you apply to the master, uh, please do look at the entry requirement. Sometimes the subject area is very important. You know, for example, pharmacy, you know, some subject, you have to be a clinical pharmacist. So you have experience in working experience before you join the master degree تمام? but it's very important to look you know you know some other courses is not important يعني I don't know some subject area where your first degree is not in pharmacy you know you could be a biology but I study pharmaceutical analysis that's not an issue while other program you have to have a, a, a degree in the same subject area before you apply to the program طيب كيف ممكن أقدم أو how do you find the information about the master course well, it depends. You know, you can go to Google search and you can put the specialized area. You can go to the university website of your interest, you know, York, Strathclyde, Glasgow, Dundee, uh, Newcastle, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, doesn't matter really. You know, whatever university you want to use and in their search engine, you can type master in pharmacy, master in renewable energy, master in whatever it is. And you see a list of the master courses delivered by them. And then you can, of course, once you go to the website, you can refine your search, search for something uh, with a specialism, you know, maybe accounting and finance, you know what I mean? Transitional studies or whatever it is. Please do look at the structure of the program that you are looking at as well, because this is very important, you know, to see that this master course is the right one for me. It's the structure of the course. I know the, the subject uh, that you need to study. So please do look at them because they are, you know, very important. Advice from me at Safiasun in UK. Wallahi ya shabab and sabaya. Do look at the subject ranking not rather than the university ranking. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's your choice, but sometimes the ranking of the subject doesn't need to tie with the top university. I mean, pharmacy at the moment, you know, Strat Clyde is ranked as the first pharmacy school in UK, okay? You know, so do look at the subject ranking. You know, medicine, maybe Dundee, you know, uh, dentistry, Glasgow, and many other subjects. So do look at the subject ranking and where the university ranking within that subject. It's very important and is advised to everybody to look at that. Okay, now coming to, that, that's generally about the master itself. Uh, uh, now, why do you need to study in UK? Why don't you go and study somewhere else? I think there is so many advantages of coming to UK. First one is a research oriented. I think, you know, I'm like you guys. I came from the Middle East. So from um, similar regions to you guys in Saudi Arabia, I think we study very well, but our research skills, I don't think is, you know, it's quite high. Therefore, coming to study a master will skills you with a research capability as well. Because remember part of your, a master degree is a research, so that will give you a, a extra credit, a extra, a, let's call it, and actually prepare you for a PhD. Because remember, PhD about research. It's about searching, about doing experiment, if it's uh, in the area of um, labs or, you know, a, a, an area of non-lab based, you need to do search. So that will, that will enable you, that will give you the, the knowledge that you need to do that. And of course, it's important for your career development, you know, for academia and industry. Something I want to mention here to you, a lot of master courses in UK, really guys, it's got industry involvement. So I know, again, I'm talking about my own uh, master courses in my university. A lot of our master courses are involved industry, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, you know, engineering companies, Scottish Power and many others. 
and a lot of students uh, who study in UK university are, or they will be able to go and do their master dissertation or research in the industry, which is very important. So you have industrial exposure and you can work for the industry and it might be an open gates for you for work experience as well. And can really change, of course, you know what I mean? You know, if you are coming to study in certain areas, it might be open doors for you and set, you know, or certain career doors for you because now you have a master level. So you have an extra uh, certificate that, you know, help uh, improving your employment, employability as well. And now in UK, I'm sure a lot of you hear that already. If you have your degree from UK, you have a, a, a visa routes, a work permit visa, where you can work for a couple of years and hopefully, you know, that will give you again a work experience. I know a lot of people taking advantage of that and working in the UK, which give you a experience. And of course, you know, what's more important, and you will see that in my last slide, which we celebrated in the line here, we hosted the Saudi society and we celebrated the foundation year. So, Cultures, you know, experience another culture, another life, learning new skills. Then we've been good for Arab and Arab. We have to suffer many difficulties or ten difficulties. But cultures, it's very important. So it's good for that as well. Now, Montez, I mean, we know the master. We know what the master look like and what the structure of that the master. But then, how to apply? And I think Mustafa and Matthew cover for the. A foundation and for the uh, bachelor degree, what is required? I think for the master degree, again, each university requirement is different. So please do check the website of the university. But generally, generally, and it's a bit difficult. Most of the UK university requirement is GPA of three out of four, usually required. Some courses might be less than that, which is two and a half, and some are maybe higher than that. So please do check the entry requirement of the program and of the university. And for the people who didn't have the GPA, there might be another route to come and study master. And we have in most of the university, a lot of the university do offer what we call it pre-master. It's almost coming and studying, you know, some subject before you go into the master program. So again, do check if you need, you know, if your GPA is low, don't think it's the end of the world, that maybe there is a route for you guys through the pre-master. You can check with the international team of that university. I'll share StrathClyde international team in a minute with you guys, but do check whatever university you're applying with, you can ask their international lead or international office and they will be able to help you. You can apply, of course, through the university website. Uh, you know, there is a link for that. Apply and you you, you download, you know, um, uh, upload your certificates and then that's you done. Of course, in UK, as you know, guys, you need to have the IELTS or the English test. Now, there is multiple universities that start accepting other uh, tests, not necessarily IELTS, you know, but it's IELTS is the main one. Again, each subject have different uh, IELTS requirements. Some need an IELTS of six uh, or six and a half. But again, if you didn't get the right um, um, IELTS score, a lot of university have the pre session English where you can come and do, it depends on your score in IELTS as 5.5 or five. There is a pre session English course which will take you to the required level before you join the master. What requirement document you need? Should the uh, uh, needs when you are applying? Should uh, the baccalaureus, of course, certificate uh, of your uh, baccalaureate degree, your transcript, should cash for علامات, معرفين, references, and you know some university will require personal statement, CVs. In UK, guys, GMAT or GRE are not required. You don't need. Uh, decisions usually is very quick. Is I think it's within a month, maybe less. You know, within a month. You should hear from the university the decision, and the usually the decision is unconditional offer, which you don't need anything if you have all the condition met, or conditional. تمام. The condition, شباب هون أو صبايا, you don't need to have. You know, when you apply, you don't need to fulfill all the conditions. You can, you know, you can fulfill the condition before you start your master level. So if the condition is English, you don't have English, you can still apply, but you have a conditional offer based on those. And hopefully reject is not an option for you, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, Mustafa Haka and Hada, there is lots of scholarship. Which organization you are coming from? 
if you are coming from university, maybe you don't need uh, Mazar Imdad or the custodian of the two holy mosque scholarship, scholarship program. You know, your university will sponsoring, sponsor you, or if you're coming, for example, Ministry of Health, there is a scholarship that they usually for their staff. So it depends where you are coming from. Do look at the, you know, what scholarship you need. There is a list, a link here, and I'm sure our colleague in the British Council will be able to share this with you, our slide. A, about the link from the Ministry of Education uh, a, for the approved program. Before you apply for any university, do look and make sure this university is program are approved by the Ministry of Education. This is very important. Funding your study, you know, you could come by scholarship or sponsorship from your own work, university or whatever it is, or your government or your employers. A, 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 most of the university are have a, a good link with them, you know, with the Saudi Culture Bureau. Dr. Amal Fattani is the culture attaché of Saudi Arabia in London here. She's one of our alumni here in, in Shakhtar University and a close friend of all UK universities. So again, most of, you know, all of the university have a link with, uh, with the culture bureaus where we can help, you know, uh, 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 in any needs required. A lot of universities have partial scholarship. If you are a self-paid student, that you don't have a scholarship. A lot of universities have a partial scholarship that can help you or discount your tuition fees. And of course, there is support student services. If you need help around finance advice or budget management, we, we can help with that. But make sure when you apply, you need to demonstrate that you have funding in a place or you need to specify that you are self-sponsored student. Finally, on my last slide, as I, I told you guys that we have here the Saudi National Day, sorry, the Saudi Foundation Year, which we hosted last Saturday, two days ago. But most of the universities have dedicated international student support team. We have three people here in Shotland, uh, uh, mainly for the Middle East, which I'll share their slide in the next, uh, I'll share their details in the next slide. We have a visa and immigration support team. If you have issues with the visa, you know, you didn't get visa on time or any issues, even even accommodation, we can help and support. We have a financial team and disability and well-being support team, career services where they can help you developing your um, CVs. And of course, we have international student society. We have the Saudi society, which is the, um, the you know, it's that what we hosted in that Saudi for Glasgow, here in Glasgow. They were dancing, they were enjoying their day. So we have we have a, a good day of that. I'm not going to show you the whole video, it's too long, but I just want to show you that you know student experience are very important. Finally, again, a, a, a congratulations on the foundation year for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Thank you to Eli and the teams at the British Council for organizing the sessions and Thank you for my international team for supporting me and preparing the slides and supporting me with this. This is a list of the people that you can contact if you are interested in applying for a master in Shark Light. We have myself, Jamie Wilson, who's the senior international officer, and Noor Jan. She's our international officer for the Middle East. And I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor. Uh, that was indeed very informative. Uh, the, flower, the floor is now open for Q&A. Over to you, Susie, if you can just provide us with the questions. Um, yes, this is um, one question in English. Can I apply for two different subjects in the same college for postgraduate degree to become specialist in dentistry? Uh, well, for each university, you need to submit one application, you know what I mean? So for the master degree, now struck light as my university, we don't have a dental school, but I know Glasgow University, our neighbor, they do have a strong dental school. So if, if you're question about applying for two at the same time, probably it's not a good idea, but to finish a master degree, let's say in a uh, maxillofacia, and don't be surprised that I know maxillofacia because my dad is a dentist. That's why I know the subject. So but, um, yeah, you can apply for maxillofacia. Then once you finish that master degree, you can apply for a second master degree in a different subject. So there is no restriction on that. You can do two, three master degree, you know, to improve your skills in one subject and then go to another subject as well. If I could just add something to that. Of Ibrahim. course, Gordon. Um, 
often, I mean, if you're looking at a, a particular subject area, and most universities will have a number of different courses in that subject area. So just because you apply for one doesn't mean that once you've been accepted, you can't then change to another. I think a lot of universities yeah. will apply that flexibility. So um, you apply for one course, you will get accepted. And then if you see kind of on review that actually the, the department has uh, a different course that is more kind of aligned to your speciality or your, your kind of ambitions, then most universities, I think, would allow you to, to make that switch. Absolutely. Um, I, I have somebody... a question for you, uh, Professor Ibrahim, yes. if I may. Can students support themselves while studying for a master's degree? Uh, are part-time jobs accessible for international students? And uh, is it enough to cover costs of living? Good question. Yes. I mean, it's coming to you. Okay, you are as a student, you are allowed to work certain hours, I think up to 20 hours uh, per month. So yes, you can work, you know, if you can, again, job, job is not easy, but it's not impossible. You can still work and support yourself. Is, is it enough to support your study? It, it depends on the job. But I think most of the jobs that I, I mean, I know a lot of people who's here in UK, who self sponsored who comes here, they are able to you know, uh, to look after themselves, you know, uh, in terms of finance. So yes, you know, I don't think this is an issue, you know, finding a job, you know, looking after yourself in terms of the life expenses, it's 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 very possible. Yes, I, I shouldn't be a problem at all. If I could just maybe jump in again. So I think the, the guidance that we have is that students shouldn't be reliant upon having a part-time job to, to fund their living expenses. So it should be seen very much as kind of contributing to your living expenses and it probably allows you to, to, to do more with your time um, overseas. But um, you should have, and, and I think the visa requirements are that you, you kind of have money to sustain yourself um, while in the, the country. And as, as Ibrahim says, there are many kind of part-time job opportunities um, available in cities around the country and it's a great way to to kind of um yeah and in, integrate and, and and get to know the the local um culture and, and environment in the city and um, but it should be seen as kind of supplementary to to your own kind of funds and and i know there was a question before or two questions one about pharmacology yes a lot of universities have a pharmacology programs I know Strathclyde have about two or three, you know, I applied pharmacology and, and others, and advanced pharmacology as well. So uh, again, look at the website of the university, look at the requirement of that program. But yeah, I mean, pharmacology is a, is, 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 is a, is a topic that it's, it's well, uh, you know, will cover the multiple institutes, you know, Strathclyde, Glasgow, and many others universities as well. I know there was a couple of questions. I mean, document, I think I covered it already. You need your transcript, you need your, a, a bachelor degree and you need your uh, sponsorship letter of course how long it's you know there's a question about how long the condition will offer for you know as long as you fill full the condition before the start of the master course in, in September you should be okay so there's no end date for the condition offer as long as you do some you know uh, fulfill the requirement of the condition offer you should be in in in, in a good shape uh, I think that's it that's the question I can see any, any other questions? I'm happy to take uh, Susie. Any other questions, Susie? Um, there are a uh, general question not uh, directed um, to master, but um, for example, here, what are the best schools to study biomedical engineering in the UK and Scotland? <laughs> I'm going to be biased here. Biomedical Don't be biased here. <laughs> exactly. Biomedical science is my department, really. You know, that's where I am now. I am in biomedical science department as well now. So it's part of my, my college and it's, it's ranked fourth in the UK. So you can look at the, you know, of, of the of, of the website and, and we do have a master and a PhD in that in, in that area. But again, you know, being fair. You know, there is many other good universities that offer biomedical sciences, but, but my, it's my own department. So, again, you have my contact details, Gordon, uh, 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 Noor, and Jamie. We all will be help, you know, happy to support you and help you uh, if needed on, on, on that particular subject if needed as well. Okay, one well, last question about... for everybody. 
um, this is regarding the ranking. Uh, some are based on marketing point of view. Which ranking would you be most preferred uh, by all professors here? QS times um, higher education. I mean, I know, I mean, I, I, again, you know, you know Susie yourself and Amy and Reem as well. Amy. In our meeting with the Ministry of Education several times, we ask what we should, you know, what is your preferred? And I know in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they're currently looking at two. The preferred one, as we have been told in the last ICE, is the QS. So do look at the QS as, as a mean one for the ranking of the university and the subject ranking. Uh, 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 times higher as well is very important. Uh, uh, Shanghai is another one. In UK, there is the university guide as well, which is a good ranking to, to look at subject ranking uh, of the university. In UK, if you're looking at general, there is something called the REF, uh, which is very important. It will tell you how the university in UK has performed in terms of research, in terms of, uh, I don't know, it's, you know, uh, research, funding, you know, knowledge exchange. They be ranked based on several uh, subjects as well. I mean, so, I, you know, QS, I would say, start with Shanghai, but specific in UK, university guides, as well as Times Higher, as well as the, um, what do you call it, the, um, the RIF for UK. That's for me. I don't know if Matthew wants to add anything. Uh, Matthew's not here anymore. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Ibrahim, for that very informative My session. Anytime. Thank you very much. So finally, we reached to our last session for today, and the session will cover PhD courses and funding opportunities. I would like to introduce Dr. Gordon, the Senior International Officer for Postgraduate Research, Recruitment, and International Office, handing it over to you. Thank you very much, Reem, uh, and thank you everyone for this opportunity to, to speak with you today. Just bear with me and I'll share my screen. We can start the presentation. Okay, is that playing the slideshow, Reem? Yes, it is. Okay. So just a, a, a brief um, slide here just on the what we'll cover uh, during the session today. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll start with the, the benefits and, and I guess the kind of motivation for studying uh, a PhD in the UK. So why, why choose the UK? Um, we'll look as well at um, what you as students should look for in a university when it comes to making your choices, which, which institution is the best for you and your PhD study. But equally, we'll flip that question round and look at what universities will look for from you uh, and what will they look for in the ideal PhD student. Uh, we'll cover the international student experience at Strathclyde, uh, sorry, um, in, in the UK. Uh, and then we'll look at the, the kind of general entry requirements for PhD study as well. Um, and then we'll kind of look into in more detail the, the application process um, as well as the, the research proposal. Um, and then um, a question we always get asked around PhD study, um, navigating the, the, the funding opportunities that are out there. So um, there are many and varied funding channels that you can explore. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through that in a bit more detail in the coming slides. Okay, so a couple of questions then we'll start with. So the, the, the benefits of studying a PhD in the UK. So why, why PhD? Um, so it's an opportunity for you as a, a, a student, um, someone who's honed their studies through undergraduate level and most likely through postgraduate or master's level as well. It's a chance to enhance your, your knowledge in your chosen subject area. So it's a very specialised um, course of study. It involves um, normally three years of intense research. Um, and so you're getting to a level of kind of subject knowledge that is um, very advanced. Um, and that kind of ties in with the second point here around developing that specialization. So often you will be um, focusing your studies on a particular, a specific area um, of your discipline and really kind of um, developing a specialist knowledge, um, which um, 
in many cases will, will have impact. M much of the motivation for, for studying a PhD is, is the resolution of, of a problem or a question. And so the, the, the motivation from the student's point of view, and of course, from the, the kind of collaborating university is that your PhD has impact. Um, and it's important to kind of think about that um, when, you, when you're at this stage in the journey. What impact do I want to have? Uh, what impact should my research have um, at the conclusion of my PhD? Um, but as well as those skills, it, it's also an opportunity to really kind of enhance your development um, in a professional and on a personal level. So um, you, you will develop the, the transferable skills that will be very useful to you in your chosen career, whether that is in continuing on in academia, um, whether that is working in kind of public or private sector, internationally or um, back in Saudi Arabia. So the, the skills that you develop during the course of studying a PhD will really stay with you um, for, for the rest of your, your working lives and beyond. Um, and obviously that has a positive impact on your employability and how you are seen by potential employers um, and, and, and the valuable contribution you can make to their, to their business or, or sector. And so why should you, you choose the, the UK? So, um, the UK, as, as has been mentioned by, in, in both presentations uh, so far, um, boasts world-class education um, and research. Um, so it, it, it's kind of recognized internationally for the quality of both the teaching, um, the education institutions, but also of the, the research that is delivered by UK universities, both in terms of the scope of that research but also, as I mentioned earlier, the, the impact of that research. Um, the, the next uh, point, so an integrated research ecosystem. So a bit of a kind of uh, buzz phrase or, or, or jargon, if you like, but essentially what this means is that the, the research doesn't happen in isolation. Um, the, the research environment at UK universities um, is a collaboration between universities, the research students and the academic staff, but also external organizations like um, national government, local government um, and private sector companies. So there's a kind of rich ecosystem that's, that's kind of feeding each other um, in a collaborative sense and you're getting input and experience from um, all sectors of society. Um, the campus experience as well is, is one that is generally very rich in, in diversity. So um, as we've heard in the previous presentations, UK universities are very internationally focused um, and our campuses will um, host students from um, many, many different countries. We at Strathclyde, for example, have, I think about 22,000 students in total um, on campus about a quarter of whom are international students hailing from 150 different countries. And that really, um, that picture is reflected across um, most university campuses across the UK. So um, you're getting a, an international experience in terms of coming to the UK and being exposed to, to UK culture and the way of life and, and the, the kind of formative experience that that represents, but equally, you're being um, exposed to and making friends with and interacting with people from all over the world. And, and that all contributes to your kind of your learning um, development, but also that kind of professional and personal development as well. It's a very supportive learning environment too. So um, as, as a student, whether that's undergraduate, postgraduate, or um, a, a PhD student, and there's all sorts of su support available to you um, that ranges from the kind of the, the, the holistic type stuff. So um, making sure that your, your overall experience at the university is an enjoyable one through things like um, kind of health and well-being services, uh, sports facilities, student union clubs and societies. But as well as that, there's, there's the kind of supportive um, academic experience as well. So you'll have um, 
supervisors and, and tutors and um, academics who can support your, your learning experience and your, your research experience at PhD level. Okay, so what does uh, a PhD candidate look for in a university? So Ibrahim mentioned the, the REF ranking. So REF stands for the Research Excellence Framework. And that is a framework which essentially um, is, is the gold standard for um, measuring research quality in UK higher education institutions. So um, analyzing or, or kind of having an idea of the research quality of the institution to which you're applying is an important part of the decision making process. You want to ensure that your university is research intensive, um, is engaged in uh, delivering um, quality um, and impactful research. And the REF rankings, the, the latest of which was um, in, in 2021, uh, is, is, is a great indicator of that and the strength of the organisation at research level. But equally, as with um, the undergraduate and, the, and the, the master's presentations, you want to look at the specialisation specific to that particular university. So um, there's no point in, in the university having a fantastic overall ranking and, and being great for research if they are particularly weak in your subject area. So ensure that in your subject area, um, your, your specialization is covered. Um, there is a level of expertise and quality research being undertaken um, at your subject level. And that also goes, um, so in the third point here, at departmental and supervisor level as well. So engage with, with, with staff from the academic departments, research the, the, the departmental pages on the website to get an understanding of um, the, the current uh, research that, that the department's engaged with, what projects the supervisors are, are currently working on, and that will give you an idea of the, the quality of the research, but also how applicable it is to your area of expertise. And then there's a more kind of holistic side of things as well. So it's not just about the academic experience. So you want to ensure that the university is a place that is very supportive of the PhD students. Um, gone are the days where, where students, um, research students, would just be working in a quiet corner of the university and just working in isolation on their chosen area of research. Um, PhD students, and I think universities generally, recognise the importance of having a, a vibrant PhD community, one that cultivates cross-departmental collaboration, interdisciplinary research. Um, so it's much more of a kind of fluid learning environment, but also in terms of that um, holistic student experience as well, and, and, and ultimately the, the social element of things as well. So um, that obviously enhances your, your network, um, both at the university, but also kind of later in life. So if you're um, working with like-minded people um, who have a passion for research and a passion for the, the subject matter, then that's a ready-made network for your, your kind of working lives um, post-graduation as well. And then you want to ensure that the university is located in a place that fits with your life out of study as well. So I think we've mentioned already that um, studying a PhD is a very demanding um course of work. So th for three years, you will be very involved in, in, in a kind of intense uh, research and study experience, but you need balance to that. So in order to um, successfully complete your PhD, you have to have balance in your life and, and to ensure that, the, that you can enjoy the life outside of study. So it's important to research the facilities at the university, um, but also um, around the, the city as well. Okay, so I, oh, I think I've gone back in myself, just bear with me. Okay, so what does a university look for in a PhD candidate? So um, this is a very important one to, to kind of ask yourselves um, before applying for a PhD. So you really need to, to be able to display um, these, these first kind of three points. So the knowledge and the depth of, of interest 
in your, your PhD subject matter. So the academic kind of credentials that we see further down the slide here, so things like your academic CV, your personal statement, and your cover letter, um, selectors or potential supervisors will want to know that you have the academic credentials. But I think equally as important for such a, a kind of intense period of study as the PhD is, they need to know that your, your knowledge of the subject matter, your depth of interest in it, and very importantly, the second point here, your commitment to it is that makes you the right fit for that PhD because for the university and for the supervisor, it's a big undertaking on their part as well. They're going to be supporting you through these three years of study. And um, so they need to know um, from your application and from the research proposal, which I'll touch on in a second, that, that you are the right person um, for, that, for that role at the university. That process may involve, uh, on point three here, a PhD interview or a kind of supervisor discussion. Um, different universities will have their, their own approach to this, but um, they, may, they may call for, once you've submitted your application, they may call you for an interview uh, on Zoom or Skype or, or whichever platform, just to get more of a sense of um, the, the, the person you are um, in relation to your, your knowledge and your commitment and passion for your subject matter. Um, or that may be something that happens more organically in kind of supervisor conversations you have um, from the, that kind of initial approach. And we'll talk about that uh, in the next couple of slides as well. Um, and then a big part of the application process from, from most institutions will be the, the research proposal. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that in a bit more depth in the coming slide. Okay, so one thing I did want to touch on was the, the PhD experience. So I talked about the, as, as well as the kind of academic experience and the research focus, it is important that you have that kind of that network, that, that vibrant community that I mentioned. Um, and, and just as an example, so here at the University of Strathclyde, we have the Strathclyde Doctoral School. So that is a kind of umbrella uh, organization within the university that looks after um, our PhD students, that ensures there is that vibrant community there of students coming from all different academic departments from all over the world as well. I think we currently have something like um, 1,800 PhD students coming from 80 different countries uh, um, associated with the doctoral school. So it creates a ready-made community there and it fosters that inter interdisciplinary research that I mentioned as well. So you're not working in isolation. Um, if, for example, you are um, a science PhD student and you're looking to, to patent your research, um, it's important that you maybe speak to um, a, a fellow marketing PhD uh, student. They can give you tips and advice on how best to commercialize uh, your research or that patent. You might need to speak to someone from the law school um, they can talk to you about the, the legal approach to, to kind of uh, securing that patent as well. So that's just a, a kind of simple example of that interdisciplinary um, environment at work. The doctoral school also um, provides formal training uh, through its researcher development program. Um, there's a, a, a PG cert, which is an additional formal qualification in researcher uh, professional development. And that basically kind of formalizes all of the transferable skills that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. So things that you would be doing anyway during the course of your studies. So like presentation skills, communication skills, negotiating skills. Um, you know, it, it, it formalizes your, your kind of learning and development through, through that and, and offers a kind of um, an additional um, additional kind of point to your CV that enhances your employability. And then part of the, the doctoral school as well is the, the doctoral researchers group. So that is a student-led body. It almost serves as a kind of mini student union, um, which uh, provides a voice and a platform for the PhD students at uh, decision-making level. So it ensures that the needs of PhD students are being addressed because those needs are often very different 
um, at PhD level compared to um, at undergraduate and and master's level. PhD students um, often tend to be a bit older, so they're perhaps looking for a different study and, and social experience at the university. Equally, many might be um, traveling with families as well, and so there are different needs that need to be catered for there, and the doctoral researchers group provides a platform for that. And then the, the just the last point there, the DSMS, um, stands for the Doctoral School Multidisciplinary Symposium. And that's a three-day conference that takes place every summer um, and showcases the research that is going on uh, among our doctoral community and students. And it's a really great example of the, the vibrant community that is the, 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 the Strathclyde Doctoral School. It brings all the students together as a great spotlight on all the, the kind of um, amazing research that has been done across the academic departments. Okay, I'll, there is a short video here, which I will, I'm, I'm mindful of the bandwidth, so I will try and play it. Um, Reem, if, if, if you can maybe just uh, let me know if it isn't uh, working too well, but we'll, we'll give it a go. All right, let's give it a go. Thank you. The Doctoral Researchers Group runs um, academic sessions, social sessions, and just like an SU, but for uh, PhDs. Yes. The ERG members are not employees, we're all volunteers, and we're all PhD students. Collectively, we just try and make the quality of life better for PGRs at Strathclyde. I joined earlier this year, and I was part of organising the big conference that we had in June. It was really great. My focus was to support the Buddy Scheme, which was a pilot programme that we started this year. Having the doctoral researchers group really empowered me and empowered my reasons to be at the university, because I think... You could get too focused on the um, academic side of things and if you weren't performing which is completely normal and completely fine i think there's a lot of pressure on phd students to be publishing all the time but sometimes that just doesn't happen so you need a support mechanism you need something else to turn your focus to i think the doctor research group really helped me do that well, the community we're all in this together we're not sort of struggling well and everybody has very similar issues and we're all trying to the doctoral research group kind of gives you a platform for every PhD student, irrespective of what level or what year you are, to start up a project, to build a project, to see it grow, or and have a support system of people who are very, very critical. They could give you uh, a, a critical, objective um, opinion to your project and encourage you. The support system is so great, <laughs> and encourage you to be the best version and give the best to that project. So. That's that's how we met, and that's how we've remained friends all through the years. <laughs> I think we, and I think this, it's a friendship that continues past the DRG. Yeah, you know, we're both leaving this year, but I still feel like it's been an amazing opportunity. And um, yeah. The doctoral researchers group runs. Um, Okay, so uh, moving on to the, the basic entry requirements for um, PhD study at UK University. So um, as, as has been said in the previous um, presentations, entry requirements will vary by institution. Um, and the, the, the documents that you need to submit, uh, the application process will vary by institution as well. So the best place to consult is um, each university's website so check the university, check your specific course for any um, specific requirements relating to, to that course. Generally speaking, though, um, a good undergraduate degree um, would be necessary, so an upper second class generally. Um, a master's degree will often be required, um, particularly for the more discursive subjects, so arts, humanities, business subjects, for example. Um, but sometimes, and, and this is certainly the case at Strathclyde, um, for, for science degrees and, and some engineering degrees, a master's degree isn't always required. If you can display sufficient research exposure in your undergraduate um, degree, then it may be possible to, to progress directly to a PhD. Um, and again, the, the English language requirements applies to PhD study as well. So uh, again, each in institution will have their own requirement, but generally speaking, something like a kind of IELTS at 6.5 um, would be applicable to, to PhD study. 
Okay, so a bit more on the application process itself and the research proposal. So as I said earlier on in the presentation, it's important to consult the, the university website to which you're applying, uh, look at the academic department and try to get a sense of the, the scope and the focus of the research that they're involved with relating to your subject matter. So it may be that Yes, you're the, 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 um, the academic department, the law school, for example, um, has a number of different law PhDs, but perhaps they don't specialize in the specific area of law that you're looking to specialize in. So it's important that you really drill down to departmental level and ensure that there is that level of knowledge and expertise among the ac academic staff in the department. And if that is the case, then step two is to identify potential supervisors. So check out the academic profiles. Again, these will be available on the university's websites. Look at their research focus, their current projects, the, the research papers they have produced. Is that relevant to um, your specific subject area? And if so, um, we can move on to step three and contacting a supervisor. So most universities will, will encourage this approach where you have an initial conversation with the supervisor discussing um, either a research proposal, if you have one ready, but equally, um, and certainly here at the University of Strathclyde, we would encourage that conversation, even if you have a kind of one page summary of your intended area of research, that's enough to to kind of initiate a conversation with your supervisor, and they will then be able to advise if there is potential with your, your subject matter, and if it is a viable option for PhD. And if so, then we can move on to number four and the more formal apl application process, um, which will often involve a research proposal. So the research proposal, um, often you will hear people kind of, um, it, it, it seems like a, a daunting prospect, the fact that you have to submit this kind of in-depth um, document to, to secure your, your, your PhD entry. Um, I think it's important to, to look at it as an opportunity. Um, I mentioned earlier the importance of being able to convey your knowledge of the subject matter and of your, your, your kind of commitment to that and your, your passion for it. The research proposal is an opportunity to do that. Um, and it's an evolving piece of work. It's something that will evolve through conversations with your supervisor, with the academic department. So it doesn't need to be perfect from the start, but it does need to convey the, the scope of your research, the, the intentions you have, as well as your knowledge and interest in the subject matter. Again, for each university, there are different structures, so I won't spend too long on this slide but it's just to give you an idea of the types of structures that universities might be looking for. Um, all this information will be available on the university's website. But I think it's important, this last point here is important, don't be deterred. Look at it as an opportunity to um, convey your interest, your knowledge, uh, your passion for that subject matter, and to convince a potential supervisor that you are the right person to be undertaking this PhD. Okay, so moving on to the last couple of slides relating to uh, funding opportunities. So um, again, as, as has been touched on, um, there, there are obviously many funding opportunities available within Saudi Arabia um, and, and to the students on this call. So at PhD level, then the custodian of the two holy mosques scholarship program um, available for Saudi nationals. It's a very comprehensive scholarship which covers tuition fees and living costs um, throughout the course of your PhD. Um, and again, as has been said previously at other levels of study, the offer of study must come from a university which is approved on the uh, institution list and the subject list um, for the, the Saudi Ministry of Education. And you can check that uh, on, the, on the ministry website and on the, the, the scholarship guidance there. There is a list of approved institutions and subject areas. Um, and there's just a note here uh, in Arabic, the, the scholarship stream for PhD study. And, and obviously there is further information 
available on that website. And then for additional kind of alternative means of funding, so there are all manner of different ways that you can secure funding um, for PhD. Um, there are many and varied channels. There's also many different ways that you can actually study a PhD as well. So the traditional um, method would be kind of um, a one-to-one -one kind of student and supervisor interaction where you spend time in the university. But equally, there are means of, of study where you can spend time in Saudi Arabia and spend a bit of time in the UK. It's called a, a joint supervision agreement. It may be that you are working with a, a private sector company and you're conducting research within your role. And the company might want to sponsor you um, for a PhD uh, in order to kind of formalize the research that you're doing anyway. Uh, into a PhD delivered by the university. And that would be this uh, the, the industrial PhD model. There's a number of uh, research grants and studentships. Uh, universities provide scholarships, many of them kind of fully funded um, or at least partial scholarships where perhaps the, the home tuition fee and the stipend is covered. And as an international student, you would then just have to make up the balance um, of that tuition fee uh, to the international fee, but it certainly represents a significant portion of, of funding over the three years. And then there's all sorts of external funding as well. So um, some of that might be sector specific, in which case the, the academic departments at the university at which you're applying may be able to provide support and advice on what sector level funding is available. And um, there may as also be private sector funding depending on the, the, the scope of your research and its, its impact. Um, and these sites here, so we, we can share these um, slides with our, our British Council colleagues so that you um, it can be shared among you and you have access to these websites. But there's, there's all sorts of information available through a range of different services uh, and external websites as well that you can consult for information on things like funding, on availability of PhDs and different subjects, as well as the funding opportunities as well. Okay, that's probably enough talking for me. So I'll hand back to you, Rim, and we can. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Gordon. Um, really appreciate your very informative presentation. Now I would like to straight away take it to Q&A. So handing it over to you, Susie, for any questions. Yeah, thank you, Rim. Uh, I have a question here about uh, part-time uh, PhD, is, if that is an option accepted in the UK. It is, yeah. yep. Yeah. So as, as I mentioned in, in one of the last slides there, there are many kind of flexible options open to you. So, um, yep, yeah, you can certainly study a part-time PhD if you're still in full-time work. Um, there are options, as I say, to, to kind of study part-time in the UK, uh, spend most of your time in, in Saudi Arabia. We we have an agreement with a couple of universities in uh, Saudi Arabia that, that has that provision where you can study uh, the external joint supervision model. So if you're currently at um, or, or even working at a kind of Saudi university, um, you can study your PhD remotely uh, and, and kind of check in at various times in the year to, to Strathclyde. So there's, there's all sorts of different uh, weird and wonderful ways for, for studying a PhD, uh, including part-time. I have another question here. Um, here is a um, uh, master degree graduate from the UK who uh, started studying the PhD in a different country, but didn't complete there. He's asking if uh, he wants to uh, pursue his PhD in the UK. Would um, any of the papers or uh, research that he um, started would be accepted in UK or he will have to start from all over again? Um, potentially, I, I think as, as with any academic transfer, and this goes for undergraduate, masters or PhD level, it's all about kind of subject mapping across the, the different institutions. Um, and, and at PhD level, um, it would really be, I think it would have to be looked at in a, in a kind of ad hoc um, case by case scenario. So I think the advice would be to identify an institution that conducts um, research that is aligned to the, the PhD you've already carried out 
and then you can approach a, a supervisor that is engaged in that research and then discuss what, what scope there is for um, effectively transferring your PhD to, to that institution. Um, it, it would really be a kind of case-by-case -case conversation. So the, the best chance you've got of it happening um, is to identify a supervisor that is um, conducting research in that field and discussing it with them. Um, that's all about PhD. Um, we, I actually see a, a question here. Is it possible to be self-funded for PhD? Absolutely, yeah. So as I say, there are many different funding routes that, that people take. And self-funding is, uh, is, is a perfectly acceptable route. Um, and if you are self-funded, there are scholarships available from universities that provide some level of assistance. Um, if, and, and they are always well worth applying for as well. But yeah, self-funding self is, is a perfectly acceptable route. Wonderful. And I'll ask this last question. Does PhD program have taught courses or is it purely research? Um, some some probably will have an element of of taught. It really, I mean, PhDs. The, the, there's no one size fits all as far as how they are taught, even within the same institution. So we have four faculties here at Strathclyde, and and the PhD experience will be very different in arts and humanities compared to how it's delivered in science. So it, it's really just dependent on your your subject area on the university you apply to and how it's delivered. Um, so there may well be, be some taught element. Um, certainly here at Strathclyde, as I mentioned, within the doctoral school, you have the researchers development program. And that is, so, so they are uh, taught lessons, but it's, not, it's less on your kind of academic um, area of research focus and more on those kind of transferable skills. So learning more about kind of your approach to tutoring and teaching, your approach to kind of presentation skills and communication and networking at, at on, in, in a kind of academic context. So um, it, will, it will very much vary by institution. Wonderful. Thank you, Doctor. Um, now this brings us to the end of our section session. Thank you everyone for joining and special thanks to today's speakers. Shukran I hope this was a useful session to all of you. And I really hope we answered any questions that you had. Um, if you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to either the British Council of any, or any of the um, guest speakers that joined us today. Uh, one important requirement for studying in the UK is is the IELTS exam. Here at the British Council, we welcome all of, all of you for assessment exams or any questions you may have. You can register and visit any of our branches in Riyadh, Jeddah, or Dammam. Please visit our website for, for, for more information. Uh, I want to close this session by mentioning our upcoming event for any alums that we have here in the call or any future alums that we have on the, during this call is um, our upcoming event on the 6th of September under the title title of UK Saudi Alumni Awards. Uh, this uh, Alumni Awards is hosted annually. And if you are a graduate of the UK University, as I mentioned, you are more than welcome to become a member of the UK Alum Net Network. Um, this is an amazing opportunity to become a part of a large network of other alums in the kingdom. Once again, thank you all for joining us. And we welcome you for any questions. Do you want to close, Eli, or should we add? Yeah, just thank you so much. Um, I just want to echo Reem's thanks um, for joining us this evening. And thank you to our fabulous speakers for their great presentations and answering so many questions. And we look forward to seeing you either at the British Council or in the UK. Thank you and good night. Masalama. Bye. Wonderful. Masalama. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.